love your theme song, John. The day after by Bumblefoot just sets the tone just oh, right yeah. for a little UFO talk with you. How you doing, buddy? Doing good, doing good. We're just uh, enjoying listening to that uh, that guy's uh, killer voice, man. Doesn't he? What have- a what a fun dude, man. That's I, I one of those guys. You know, normally I don't I don't like you know think about these sort of things, but definitely someone I would love to share a pint with someday. Oh yeah, yeah. He's definitely beer and tacos. He's beer and tacos, and that's a compliment. That is. No, totally- he, he, he's honestly he's like your little mini me, man. Like hearing you guys talking about the hot sauces was cracking me up. Oh. Uh- He's got me beat, man. I could take some hot stuff, but he has got me beat by a mile. I don't know well, if I, I could ever touch that. I love hot sauce, but he de- he defined the line for me. As soon as it's crossed that line where where it destroys the flavor, you can't taste anything anymore. That's that's my limit. Where I'm like, what's the point? I still want to taste the food, you know. Dude, I almost died the night I did the Pocky One Chip Challenge. Did you film it? Yeah, it's on uh, Periscope somewhere. Okay, I'll look for it. That's and, awesome. I want to see that. <laughs> but I mean, it was crazy, man. Like my ears were burning. Uh, my my entire neck and shoulders and arms went numb, and I had to rip my. Uh, I was wearing earbuds oh at the time. I had to rip those out because my ears felt like they were going to explode. I mean, just the stupidest thing I've ever done. What I, I would probably do it again with some coaxing. Of course you would. You know, <laughs> 1.9 million Scoville units in your mouth out of a potato chip is just stupid. He said 4 million for one and of those things he ate. Yeah. Well, he did six of them in a row, like put six of the chips in his mouth. I'm, I'm dying surprised you can one. taste anything anymore. Yeah. You, no, no, no. There's not enough milk in the world to take away <laughs> that pain. Not enough milk. <laughs> Anyways. Oh, man. on here. Uh, this story that you mentioned to us just a couple of nights ago about Einstein and Man. his his assistant uh, and her deathbed confession about Roswell and aliens. This is gaining major steam, man. Well, and the thing is, is it well? Okay, well, first off, first off, everyone, I need to apologize. Um, uh, I got, I got, I got two things wrong myself, and then one of my sources got something wrong, and so I, I need to come and make some quick clarifications on this case before we go any further. Um, uh, uh, Doctor Shirley Wright passed away in 2015, not 2012. Um, it also means that it was not a deathbed confession because it was actually taped in 1993. So she was many, oh, wow. many years before death. Yes. Um, it turns out it appeared in a book um, by Schofield um, that came out many, many years ago, but it was done with, an, with a fake name. And so that's why we didn't know who she was. And so this was not a deathbed confession. Um, the, um, the other thing that I'll get into more in a second is that not everyone died. There was a surviving occupant, and there's more to that. And uh, and then the last thing is this was not a mystery war. This was on coast to coast. So I was a mess here, and I do apologize. Um, I got the coast to coast thing and the date wrong, and I do apologize. But the fact about the occupant surviving and, and actually communicating um, was uh, was not totally my fault. I will blame someone else for that one. Um, but, you know, to be kind, I'll leave names out. But, yeah, no, this story is um, it's getting steam. And what's fun is that um, – uh, Anthony, um, is it, is it, is it, Bregalia. B- B- Bregalia? um, not only did he just do a great job, I mean, you guys, uh, I'll supply a link to you. You got to check out his site. He just did a, it's a really nice clean write up. It has all the interviews on it. You can listen to them right there. He does a really nice, he's got pictures and everything, but a bunch of other people are doing great reporting on it. Um, a friend of the show, um, Thomas, um, uh, Fessler, Fessler, right? Yeah. Fessler? Uh, he did a great episode on this um, uh, on Monday or Tuesday that I, I also highly recommend people check out where he you know goes into this in detail, talks about her background and, and goes into a lot of really good details. And so I, I really we won't have that kind of time here. So I encourage everyone to check that out as well. And so there's a lot of good material being worked on around this. Um, you know, the one thing I will want to say point of blank is that all we have is the recordings. OK. So the recordings are the only evidence we have. And so that's an important thing to remember off the bat before you get too excited about this story because it's fun. But there is that caveat that the only evidence we have is this recording. But, oh, my God, Dave, this story. So it turns out that she was selected at, as, as part of a grant program to essentially select top students for Einstein to mentor. 
So she got picked. I believe she was about 17 when she got picked. And she was basically Einstein's like, like pet student for a couple years. Right. Like, I mean, he really like, like took her, took her under his wing. And, um, and so they grew very close. And so basically, you know, as I stated before, Einstein got called off to this meeting. She, you know, w- w- took with him because she was just part of his, his entourage. But where things get super interesting, which I want to get to really quick before we run out of time, is that when they got there, as I said before, they, they saw the ship. The ship was quite large. It was damaged. Um, well, she wasn't allowed to go into the ship. Um, Einstein was. And he did tell her some things about what was in the ship, like the fact that it was a very spacious ship with mostly components around the edge. But there were objects that would come out of the floor with control panels on them that were activated by by some by either movement or by some some indication that basically inside the ship. So they did actually get to explore inside the ship. But where things get really interesting is, and this is all covered in the interview, and you can listen to them. They're only like maybe 10 minutes and I think eight minutes long. There's a third interview that they're the tape that that, um, that um, uh, Sheila, um, um, uh, uh, blah, 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 where, where'd her name go? Um, oh, uh, Sheila Franklin. She's the investigator that did the recordings. So Sheila Franklin is still looking for that third recording. She is still alive and she's the one who Anthony uh, uh, Bregalia has been working with. And so she's still looking for this for that third tape. But in this tape, what she describes is that there was nine occupants. Eight of them died on contact. One of them survived. And unlike what I reported before, while he was verbally just making sounds, According to what Einstein told her, he was communicating via telepathy and they interviewed him. And there was a back and forth exchange of questions. He would ask a question. They would ask a question. And she remembered many of the answers he gave. So you want to hear a couple of them? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Bring this on. So, so, so questions that he asked, he wanted to know how long we lived. He wanted to know what sort of conditions would terminate what we referred to as life. He wanted to know what was the best system that we had for exploring outside of our atmosphere and outside of our oceans. He wanted to know how deeply we had penetrated the galaxy. So not only were these interesting questions, but what they showed in detail was how little he knew about us. Okay. This was not a being that had spent a bunch of time like investigating us or or spending time with us. This was someone who had come, you know, fairly new, right? Um, He was very quick to make it clear that we were completely clueless. We had absolutely no idea what we were doing. So there was some arrogance that came through. Um, what he said was that they um, appeared to be exploring for a new energy source because essentially something where they lived had been exhausted. Um, they uh, so they were looking for for a new energy source. Um, when they found Earth, um, they w- arrived in eight ships. Two of them went down. One of them in New Mexico. The other one, according to him, in Siberia. Now, he didn't know Siberia, but when he described the location of where it went down, they figured out it was Siberia or the other one went down. No word if that craft was recovered by anyone. I have to assume it was recovered by somebody. Um, and uh, the, he did not know what took down the ship. Um, he at, uh, at one point was getting ready to actually go back into the ship to help explain more about how the ship worked when he expired. So he did not live very long. She was not there when he expired. She was back at the hotel when he expired, but he expired while they were there on their trip. Um, she did say that he was very careful as to what he said. He clearly seemed to be um, uh, being very cautious about how much information he gave out about his own his own group to us. Um, and um, she she was not able. She didn't know exactly what um, what all the answers we got from him was as far as the questions we asked. Uh, she you know she struggled a bit to to remember what she did. But um, it is a it is one hell of an interview. And you guys you got to go listen to it. And I'll I'll provide the link in the thing. And I'm sorry I talk so much, Dave. I, this is just really exciting stuff, man. 
that is exciting. It's it's very exciting to to hear this. I mean, the sad part about it is, you know, it's anecdotal. Yeah, we have we have to take her resume and her word on this because you know this is the type, John. When when you and I have talked both publicly and privately about this entire phenomena, you know, I, I hear this, and I'm I'm goosebumping. Oh, I yeah. really am. I really am goosebumping oh, uh, yeah. for for a, for a good reason. Okay. But when I hear stories like this, it also makes me think that this is why we have an entirely controlled narrative of the UFO phenomena right now. Because if if this came out of Pandora's UFO box, this is the type of stuff that the mainstream public is not ready for the people who live by the the day by day the instagrammers the the influencers and and everything like this worried about you know their their 2.1 1947 I know man 47 but this, I mean this is what I'm saying though is if my dad don't... was two <laughs> yeah my my dad wasn't even born <laughs> you know it's but, shocking but I mean, this is what I'm saying, though, regarding this phenomena. Okay, is when we look at it and we and we take it for the information that we are not being told. This UFO Pandora's box that is out there that the the United States government does not want us to get really, to me, solidifies if this is 100 percent true. Why? They are controlling the narrative on the entire story that comes out because there's a lot of secrets out there that they want none of us to know about. Well, and but and that the problem is, is it if you think about it, I mean, what, what Einstein was clearly after was was what he could learn about physics from from this adventure and what he could learn about propulsion systems. OK, now you're talking about a time where the U.S. had gone from a a a pretty much middle class country to the leaders of the world and it was all because of science right and it happened in a very short period of time right it happened in about a 10 year period and so this is this is 10 years into that period and so everyone's going to look at this as this is the key to us staying ahead for the next 200 years and the problem is is that there's there is no way in, in america there is because of the freedom of press there is absolutely no way for the government to tell the american people anything at all that the rest of the world doesn't hear so the right. u.s government has to look at telling anyone in the american public anything as also right. notifying every other country in the world and so as a result i i don't i can't blame them I mean, the strategic advantage here is is it's it's earth shattering, right? And so, how how could you the instant you announced it, what would happen? I mean, the, the there'd be a world of explosion of people demanding access to it, demanding pieces of it. I mean, you, wars would break out over the ship. Absolutely, absolutely, man. And that's why even even today, you know, there's so many questions about the whole disclosure movement and what it means and what it truly means. Yep. It really shows if this is true, the, the entire narrative that goes along. I got to ask you this question though. How did Anthony Bergalia come across this audio? This is the best part. And I haven't had a chance to talk to him. So I I'd really like to, just to make sure I understand. But my understanding is he stumbled into it. <laughs> that that essentially my understanding was was that he was interviewing um he was interviewing uh, Sheila Franklin for some other reason because Sheila Sheila Franklin was an investigator she worked for MUFON for a while and so he was interviewing her for other reasons suddenly this came up in conversation and he's like well do you have anything of it and she's like oh yeah I still have the recordings do you want to hear them <laughs> fell right into his lap that's my understanding and I need to get that clarified but that's my understanding. That's my, my, my understanding is it, it was, this was not what he was originally looking for. I mean, yeah. this is huge. I oh, mean, it's gigantic. I mean, the fact that those were sitting 
in a dusty desk somewhere for a long time. And she can't time. find the third one. It's, it's like, I, I missed, I lost some socks. And oh, this third recording of, of, of this. And the thing is, this woman, this woman went on to have an illustrious career. She had a, she had a very established, beautiful scientific career after this. So, she, I mean, she, she was a completely upstanding citizen until the recording of this one thing. Oh, wow. Wow. All right, man. Uh, you know, when you when you set up the news for me and I only saw one topic tonight, I was like, what's John doing? I know, man. The truth is, I could you, you and I could go on for three hours. I mean, this is this is this is so huge. It's so much fun. And but the thing to your point is really important. This is anecdotal. It's strong anecdotal. It's a recording and it's a recording we can all access. But that's the only evidence we have. And everyone must remember that when when processing this story, because it's easy to get too excited. Well, as you I, can see, <laughs> I think we got to try and get uh, the booking team on to uh, get Anthony Brigali on. I agree. I, I think we really need to uh, look into this more. And this is a story that we got to keep on top of. And you're doing a great job with that. John, thank you so much for another fantastic uh, UFO report. Stick around. We'll talk to you in a few minutes in the after. Sounds good. We'll talk to you in a second. Let's get to Shirky Poo's news.